Hey, welcome to Can of Conversation number 416. Continuing our letters from a skeptic questions. We are on question number 11. Why would an all-powerful God need prayer? Why would an all-powerful God need prayer? <clears throat> the answer is he doesn't. We're the ones that need prayer, not God. A prayer is basically it's a petition to God. It's sort of like a judge. You go before a judge and you pray for the mercy of the court or pray for him to do something for you that you want done. The judge doesn't need you to pray to him, uh, but his position is to listen to your pleas and make a correct judgment. So, yeah, an all-powerful God, he doesn't need prayer. But, again, this goes back to God is love and God has a glory plan to glorify us in His Son for all eternity. And that requires free will faith. We have to have faith in what God says. Again, God could have, if He's all powerful, which He is, God could have made mind numb robots and just program them in a certain way to do a certain thing, not have any free will, and and then everything would be done the way he wanted it to be done. But robots cannot experience and give off love or God's glory. Those things can't come from machines. You have to have the element of free will. Now, there was a movie you may have seen called Bruce Almighty and Jim Carrey is Bruce and God makes him God over the over his two blocks of his world. Well, he likes this girl named Grace in there and he wants her to love him. Well, he can do anything he wants to do. He can cause a team to win, his favorite hockey team to win. He can cause people to win the lottery. He can grant prayer requests. He can do whatever he wants. But he can't get the girl to love him. Love isn't, it cannot be forced. If it's forced or if it's programmed into you, it's not love. You could get a robot to, you could program a robot to maybe fixy dinner, let's say. But, so you get to eat, but it didn't do it because it loved you. But you get your wife to fix you dinner. She does it because she loves you. She could, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, that's why Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. The way God spreads His love and the way He gets glory, His Son gets glory, and we get glory is through the outpouring of love. And the outpouring of love only takes place through a free will decision to exhibit that. And love has to be unconditional or else it's not love. It's just wanting to do something for someone else with nothing in return. And that only takes place under free will. If you have to, if you're programmed to do it, it's not love. Sure, the, you know, in the example, the dinner is made and the person gets to eat, but they don't get that dinner out of love. It was just something programmed in. Then there could be other motivations. Maybe you do it to, like a restaurant. I go to a restaurant and get a beautifully prepared meal for me. They didn't do it because they loved me. They did it because I gave them money to get that. There are all kinds of motivations, but the best one of all is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 
It says, you know, charity never faileth. It says charity is patient, kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrongs. You've got all these different things listed there. And it says charity never faileth. That's why love or charity is the highest thing in the world. Because it's pure, unconditional, self-sacrificing, only considers the other person. And that's what God is. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. And so, yes, God is an all-powerful God, but that's not the appropriate question to ask. We should not be asking, why would an all-powerful God need prayer? It is because an all-powerful God doesn't. Just like I mentioned the robot, you can program the robot to make your food. That's sort of like an all-powerful type concept. I use my power to force the robot into making me dinner because I programmed it like that. There's no love involved in that robot doing that. But when you ask why would an all-loving God, that's a different story. God isn't interested in just showing His power, zapping people, causing them to do what He wants them to do. The power of God is His love. Romans 5, 8 says, God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And over in Romans 9, it says, God wanted to make His power known to the Gentiles. Well, Romans 1, about verse 16, tells you that what that power is. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The way God wants to show His power or make His power known is to commend His love toward you in dying for your sins, sending Jesus to die for your sins, and then giving you eternity with Him. And that's really the highest goal. It's not just to zap something, you know, like, like you got today these, the world's strongest man contests. And, you know, Brian Shaw could take a, I don't know, 800 pounds probably and do a deadlift with it or lift 400 pounds over his head. I don't know what, what he can do. But he can lift all these heavy weights and move them around. And they can say, oh, he's the world's strongest man. And that's some glory in that. But the greatest glory of all isn't that I've got all this power and then I show that I have this power. The greatest glory is not showing power, but it's the power to love. It's showing love. It's being able to, you know, you look at that. You look at us as humans. We don't even approach God's love because of our sin nature. A husband and wife may get married and say they love each other and they may do a lot of good things for each other and be together for you know, 50, 60 years. But it's not an unconditional love provided it's with the sin nature. Apart from God, there is no unconditional love. So even though the wife may appear very loving, there is some selfish motivation, at least in part, behind what she does for her husband, and vice versa. Only with God do you have unconditional love. God did not love us because we were so wonderful. In Deuteronomy 7, when it says God chose Israel, He exalted Israel above all nations. It says that He did not set His love upon them because they were great in number, for they were few in number. And it seems like that's the reason why God will love the un unloved, unwanted, the disadvantaged, the ones that have nothing in this world. And the reason is because then 
no one can accuse God of conditional love. Everything he does is unconditional. God's motivation is simply to just to show love to everyone. And so here we are in sin, doing wicked, doing evil. God cannot even behold evil. It's so gross to them, gross to him. And yet he commends his love toward us and dying on a cross for our sins. I mentioned in the last candid conversation, God being a pure eyes to behold evil is sort of like a person a day. They couldn't, they couldn't watch someone raping a child. It's just too gross of an evil for that to be seen. They couldn't handle it. Well, God is the same way when it comes to sin. He's, his eyes are so pure that he can't even behold evil. He is so high above us, and yet all of us are evil. Genesis 6 says, Every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. And yet in that state, meaning there is no lovable quality in us, God sent his son to die on a cross for our sins. That shows God's love is unconditional. And so that's God's part, but then you got to have man's part, meaning man has to accept it. I mean, that's the easy part, right? But it's really hard for man because we have to get out of our own pride in order to overcome, overcome the lust of the flesh and the sin nature. We have to allow God to do that for us. When we recognize we're a sinner and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin, then God gives us the gift of eternal life. He commends our, His love toward us. And then through the suffering, as we mentioned last time, then we can share God's love to others. We have to get to that point of brokenness where we stop trusting in our own flesh. That's why there is no true love apart from God. Because all of us in our sin nature are motivated by lust, not by love. Only God is motivated by pure, unadulterated love. And so when the question is asked, why would an all-powerful God need prayer? Again, he's not the one that needs prayer, just like a judge. A judge sits up there. He has the power to be merciful or to be unmerciful or just to judge correctly. That's just what the judge can do. You can pray to him for mercy, or you cannot pray to him for mercy. It doesn't change the status of the judge, because he has the power to do whatever is right. Similarly with God, an all-powerful God does not need prayer. But an all-loving God needs prayer. Not that it affects him any. Again, God is love whether you accept his love or not but it's just he cannot share his love through you to others and he cannot glorify his son in you if you do not freely accept his love make the free will decision to accept his love where he died Christ died for your sins and then allow Christ to live in you on a day-by-day -day basis and in order for you to do that, you don't have any power within you to do that. Philippians 3.21 says, even after we're saved, that we are in our vile body. Romans 7.18 says, even after we are saved, that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform it I find not. Paul asked the question at the end of Romans 7, all, he says, all I am is condemned because of, I condemn myself because here I am trying to do all these good things and I can't do it. And the evil that I don't want to do is what I do. So he asks at the end of Romans 7, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall save me from the body of this death? It's a vicious cycle I am under. Before I'm saved, I don't even know what love is. After I'm saved, I've got God's love, 
But as long as I and my flesh try to share it, because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, then I don't have the capacity to love others as God does. I don't have the unconditional love of God coming through me unless I allow Christ to live in me. So he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who delivers us. That's why Romans 8 starts off with, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. It takes God commending His love toward us to save us, and it takes God through Christ living in me to share His love through me to others. But I have to make the free will decision to get my flesh out of the way and not obey the lust thereof. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Christ liveth in me. Christ is the one who does the, the spiritual things in me, the spiritual things of God, demonstrates God's love through me. But the only way He does it, again, just like salvation, if God forced me to have eternal life in heavenly places, that wouldn't be God, that wouldn't be love, that would be compulsion. And so I wouldn't know what love is, just like the robot who makes the dinner. The robot doesn't know what love is. It's a machine. It is programmed to do stuff. It does not make free will decisions. So because the robot doesn't know what love is, it cannot show love. When it makes the dinner, it does not do so out of love. It does it because it's programmed to do it. So too, if I do not make the free will decision to believe the gospel, then I do not have God's love. And I don't know what, God, what love is. And after I'm saved, then God has commended his love toward me. Christ living in me. He is the love of God because God is love. And he says, I and my Father are one. So now if I allow Christ to live in me, God's love comes through me. But again, just like with the robot, I have to make the free will decision to allow Christ to live in me. If God forced me to serve him after I was saved, then I would not be showing love to others. Most, uh, most churches out there, when they do things, they say, oh, well, we're sharing God's love. We want you to know that God is love and we're sharing God's love to everybody. No, you're not. When you put on a shirt that says, I'm on the serve team, and you're bragging to others about how you love the Lord and how God is living through you, well, when you're doing that, you're making your works known to men that they may glorify you. God doesn't say to do that. He says to allow God to come through you and that they see the good works of God coming through you and then they glorify God. And the only way I'm able to do that is by making the free will decision to allow Christ to live in me. And the only way that I allow Christ to live in me is through prayer, which is our question. Why would an all-powerful God need prayer? Again, an all-powerful God doesn't need prayer. He doesn't need anything. He's got everything. But in order for God's plan to be fulfilled of God demonstrating His love toward others through man, then we have to accept His love by being saved and then we have to make the daily decision, I die daily, to die to our flesh and allow Christ to live in us. And then God's love comes through us to others. And that takes prayer because you're petitioning God to say, you know, God says, when a man is tempted, do not say that you are tempted of God. God will not allow the temptation that you face to be greater. The temptation comes from your own sin nature, from your flesh, from Satan and his policy of evil. 
And even so, God does not allow a, your temptation to be more than you can bear. But with the temptation makes a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. The prayer is needed to petition God to say, I'm not going to trust in my own flesh, but I'm going to allow Christ to live in me. Again, God doesn't need prayer. He does not need us to come to Him. God is still God. He is still love, whether I choose to accept it or not. If no person would ever believe the gospel and would never allow Christ to live in them, God would still be love. God would still have glory. It doesn't change the character of God. It's just if no one would accept His love, then His love isn't demonstrated as much. You look at this time of year, this is around Christmas time, you'll have people, these charities, Salvation Army be ringing a bell at the, at the Walmarts trying to get money. People will give gifts to others. You have to, in order for that system to work, of the gifts, you have to have someone who is rich enough to be able to buy the gifts, and you have to have someone who's poor enough who will accept and appreciate the gifts. If everybody, if it's say socialism and say it's a perfect utopia where everybody has billions of dollars and you don't need, you could just snap your fingers and get it, um, you couldn't in a material way anyway, you could not demonstrate love to others in a material way because I don't need you to give me something, I can just get it myself. And spiritually speaking, of course, it works differently because we're talking about spiritual things, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, the things of the Spirit. But it's the same way. You've got people who are unbelievers, who need God's love, who have not accepted it yet, and then you've got people who are believers who have accepted God's love, and so we need to commend that love to others. God commend His love toward us, and then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But as saved people, 2 Corinthians 5 says, we are ambassadors for Christ to reconcile people to God. Jesus told His disciples in John 13, 34, and 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. God has His love. He's ready to commend it to people. He doesn't need to do so. He is still God. He is still love, whether you accept it or not. But His love is such that He wants all people to have. That's why 1 Timothy 2.4 says God's will is for all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So again, God doesn't need you to pray to Him. But in order for God's love to be shown to all people, the more people pray to Him, meaning, when I say pray to Him, meaning that they set aside their old sin nature and the flesh and they petition God to allow Christ to live in Him, in them. And the way they do that is through sound doctrine built up in the inner man as they read and believe God's Word. And then they make decisions based upon that sound doctrine. When they do that, they are commending God's love to others so that they may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And all of that takes prayer because God's love only comes from God. There is no love apart from God. I cannot receive the gift of eternal life unless I go to God for it. So I need to pray in order to receive God's love. And then I cannot demonstrate God's love to others unless I pray or have that sound doctrine built up in my inner man and petition Christ to live in me so that Christ lives in me rather than me fulfilling the lust of the flesh. So the way God demonstrates His love toward us, He's demonstrated, but the way that we accept God's love and give it out to others is through prayer. 
So an all-powerful God doesn't need prayer, but for God's love to be shared to others, he does need prayer. And again, it's not that he's not all-powerful, that he can't demonstrate, because he already demonstrated his love in Christ dying for our sins. Uh, no one prayed to God for that. I mean, believers prayed for God's mercy, but I mean, directly speaking, uh, unbelievers did not ask God to send a Messiah, and believers, although they did ask for the Messiah, did not pray for the Messiah to be killed. A believer wouldn't want that, wouldn't want him to be killed. I understand he wants him to be sacrificed for their sins, but he wouldn't want him to be killed, murdered. And so no one prayed for that, and yet God commended, it, commended his love toward us anyway. So God's able to demonstrate his love without prayer. So he is all powerful. He doesn't need us, but in order to show his love to people, it must be shown through people. And so it is us praying for God to show his love through us. So that's our free will decision. Uh, and that's and so that's what prayer is really all about. It's petitioning God to allow God to live in us or to save us and allow God to live in us rather than us trying to fulfill the lust of our flesh. Uh, so an all-powerful God doesn't need prayer, but prayer is necessary for God's love to be demonstrated to others because we must make the free will decision to accept it and to spread God's love or else it's not love. Thanks for watching.